Well, good evening once again, viewers. Uh, it's again at the Enterprise Uganda Business Forum or engagement. And um, on these forums, uh, we are looking at the practical uh, solutions, business solutions within the COVID-19 uh, pandemic period, if you like, or era. And then uh, we're also looking at the post-COVID-19 uh, era. So we are taking the practical way, trying to look for what uh, businesses can do to actually weather the storm within you know, these challenging times. And as usual, today we have people who are in you know, the thick and thin of things in the business world, uh, people who are tested, who have actually been you know, practicing business for quite some time. Um, uh, please um, join with me in welcoming uh, Mr. Aga Sekalala Jr., uh, Executive Director, Yuga Chik Uganda. Aga, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you. Very good. Um, again, we have uh, Patricia, Patricia Biarugaba from Nina Interiors, Managing Director. You're most welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Very good. And uh, again, as usual, we have Mr. Charles Ochichi, uh, the Executive Director Inter Enterprise Uganda, a business coach who has mentored quite a number of entrepreneurs, you know, in the world of business. Charles, you're welcome to the show. Thank you so much and happy to be in this afternoon uh, show again. Very good. Now, viewers, we're going to be looking at um, <coughs> a number of issues um, that really you as a business person, uh, you could be contending with at uh, this particular moment in time. Of course, borrowing a lot from the experiences of these uh, seasoned business people and uh, coach in the studio. Uh, but for starters, let's take a recap of what really transpired last week. Remember last week we had uh, another group of business people. Um, we had uh, uh, the chairperson of Casita, who is also a business person. And we also had, uh, uh, that is Mr. Ivaristo Kayondo. We also had uh, mm -hmm. Barbara uh, Ofono, the proprietor of uh, Victoria Schools. And we learned a lot from them. I think we're going to start from there, Charles. Um, just a recap, a digest of what transpired last time before we delve into the discussion for this uh, day. What did you pick out of those discussions we had last week? Um, there were quite a, a number of interesting lessons that came out of um, the story of Barbara Fono and the story of Casita as well as the Kayondo's own personal business journey. But because of time, I'm just going to pick two key learnings from uh, Barbara Fono's story and then about two key learnings from uh, the Casita team. Mm. From Barbara Fono's story, we, we could see that um, there is power in sharing authentic information mm. when you're in a crisis. And authentic information is information which is current and as accurate as possible. Mm. If you can bring out the currency and the accuracy of the information and throw it to the key stakeholders, and who are these key stakeholders? We're talking of your customers, in this case, those parents and, and students. We're talking of suppliers, your own employees, you're talking of your own bankers. If you can share the information that you currently have, mm -hmm. not just you being the dominant this, uh, provider of information, but also the person receiving information from these other stakeholders, yep. that platform will bring a lot of harmony, a lot of unity, and it is what you need under circumstances of COVID and such challenging times. Mm -hmm. So that story came out very, very clearly from the story of um, Barbara's journey. But also there was something that came when the Q&A session came up and a parent asked Barbara that Barbara, when we closed the term, we had one more month to go and we feel that the value of that money was not got. And she gave a very, very rich response that I want every listener to take home. She said, Whenever, wherever you are, whatever you do, whatever the circumstances, seek to be of value to your customer. And she went ahead and explained that and said, when times permit and we're able to re-engage with our students, our learners, we will make sure that the lost one month will be covered and covered fully. Mm. Without anybody having to push the owner of the school to achieve that. And that is extremely important because the last person you want to cheat is the person who actually has the power to keep you in business or to remove you from business, and that's the customer. So no matter the circumstances, be of value. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, even when nobody is checking and looking at you, just do it right. 
That is the kind of wisdom you need and need permanently whenever you are doing anything as an employee, as a business person, as a church owner, mm -hmm. or even as a philanthropic uh, leader, mm -hmm. or even head of state, mm -hmm. or a public uh, politician. When we came to Casita, interesting stories came out of there. One was that resources are not the limitation when you are dealing with hardware, retail, and trading operations. They get money. But when they get these monies, the challenge we are having is how do we take advantage of these profits that keep on coming? I've been occupying a two by two meter shop for the last 15 years. But the profits that I've been getting, I've received them. Where do I take those resources? If these people are not guided on how to deploy those resources, they all crowd in a common destiny. And one of those that came from Kayondo's own uh, sharing was that many of them have tended to go to these huge arcades, mm. the malls. Ground floor is occupied. First floor, a bit occupied. Second, third, fourth, they are empty. But those are resources, mm -hmm. idle. And then because now they have these land titles, the second learning came in. Because they have these land titles and they are visible to the banking industry, the banker says, you know what, I can make you get another cage so that you are better than so and so. So they go in and get more loans. And what happens as they get more loans? They actually affect their cash cows, the very trading operations that gave them the money. Mm. So many of them who are even market leaders, some of them were market leaders in electricals, some of them were market leaders in hardware businesses, they have had a challenging time to remain in that space. Actually, that was a very good learning, actually. Yeah. You know, um, and I want to move on, um, coming to today's discussion. Mm -hmm. um, Aga, you sit in a very important sector, the agriculture sector. Yes. In fact, I was looking at the numbers, and uh, it is showing that, you know, during the COVID time, uh, the lockdown, so to speak, because we are still mm -hmm. under COVID anyway. Um, three sectors that are critical for this economy, that is agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Yes. Of the three, it's only agriculture that expanded. Services and manufacturing shrank. Um, we want to pick your experience. What or how did you, you know, uh, or do you view, you know, the um, performance of the agricultural sector from where you sit? away from the numbers we are reading? Okay, I mean, um, thank you. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I think the issues are, are several. I think if you think about agriculture on its own, um, uh, the, the crops and the animals uh, continue. Mm -hmm. um, you um, animal, uh, if you have planted beans or a garden of beans or a garden of maize, you can't switch it off and say, well, COVID has come now. I don't, <laughs> want, I don't want that maize to come through. Mm. However, I sit in the middle whereby we're doing agro-processing. So yep. what, is, what is agriculturally grown, for instance, maize, is converted into animal feeds. Or, what, um, or if it's an animal, it's conf converted into protein. And uh, ag uh, that, is, that is also partly manufacturing and partly agriculture. Mm. The, the, the issues have remained the same uh, for that sector as other sectors that there have been demand shocks, there have been supply shocks. Supply shocks could have, re could have resulted into oversupply. Mm -hmm. For instance, you saw many stories, mm -hmm. uh, you saw many stories of eggs, mm -hmm. and there were eggs on pickups, they were everywhere. And uh, people, uh, farmers, had to go out to hawk these eggs that formerly were picked up by, uh, by Kenyan trucks. They would come in, buy the eggs, and take them to Kenya for export. 60% of the egg production in Uganda is actually going to export. Mm -hmm. Currently, that market has dried up. So there was a surplus. There is a glut of eggs, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes across into beef, into milk, mm -hmm. into a lot of other sectors, some of which where the producers are not able to um, spend a lot of time to show the amount of wastage, the amount of milk that they spilled, the amount of uh, the amount of meat and uh, uh, protein that was poured down the drain. But it has happened. Uh, uh, it has happened. And these sectors have had to take a bit of a long-term view and readjust and say, okay, what do we do? We're still around. People need to consume. Supply the market that's there. 
But the market we had, we had been used to, or the market that we had targeted, was a regional market, a big market, which we can't support right now. That is what you're we mean. can't get to it. So you have an inability to get to your, to your consumer. But then also remember, your consumer, some of them have not been working for two months. Mm. So some of my consumers are working in an arcade, for instance. The arcade is shut down. They're not going to buy a chicken. They might not buy a tray of eggs. These are all deprived. These mm. are all constricted consumers. Mm. They are chicken, not chicken becomes luxury. Chicken mm. is a luxury. Mm. So it's much easier and much more convenient to buy maybe beans. Mm. I hear you. That's a good one. Uh, Patricia, mm. you see, Aga sits in a, a sector that is uh, you know, close to the basics of life. It's food. Uh, you are in a sector which I would call, you know, we have a new word now, essential. Non-essential, not in the sense of <laughs> essential, <laughs> but, you know, uh, given what uh, we are going through at this particular moment, you know, furniture probably becomes, you know, uh, brought down the list of things that someone might want to look at at this particular moment in time. Give us your experience. Um, for starters, how has this affected your operations and how are you weathering the storm? Thank you, Charles. Um, you've described our industry as non-essential. But even though we are described as non-essential, the important thing is that we are still relevant mm. to our market. This period has been tough, has been tough for us, especially the lockdown, because it meant that we were not earning. We were not operating to full capacity. Um, our consumers are not working, they are not earning, so they can't spend. Yeah. And it has really been uh, hard for us because our cash flows were practically depleted. At the time of the lockdown, we had already placed orders. So we had containers coming in, taxes need to, needed to be paid. They were depending on cash flows, they were depending on sales, which didn't happen. So that for us was a really tight period for us, really, really tight. And then of course the logistics um, of getting things into Uganda. We know that they, uh, people are working on half capacity at Mombasa. So it, the bureaucracy is there. It was very difficult to get things processed through Mombasa. And then now, even after the lockdown, we have the, the mandatory testing. So truck drivers don't want to come to Uganda. So getting a truck with your goods to Uganda is, is almost impossible. And even when you do get a <coughs> truck, they're going to spend like three to four days because of the, they have to wait for their results. So those are challenges that, that we face. But um, I think one challenge that we faced that was difficult, especially for me personally, was that you had people sitting at home. They depended on an enterprise that was going to, from which they earn an income. But this enterprise is not earning because it's not open, it's not selling but they're sitting at home expecting an income. What do you do? It was two months, almost three months, that we had to pay salaries without earning. Mm. So you're paying rent, you're paying salaries, and yet you're not earning. It, it's, been, it's been a tough period. I hear you. Charles, I'll come to you. Um, mm. You cancel enterprises. Yeah. I mean, you've faced with this kind of scenario. Yeah. Yeah, on uh, one part, like Aga said, you have mm. You know, uh, actually the rains have been on our side this a bit of last year. Mm -hmm. Actually, most of last year and early this year. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of good performance at the farm level. Mm -hmm. But it mm -hmm. goes beyond that. You have this crisis disrupting the entire value chain. Uh, with Patricia, I mean, you've seen from where, she, uh, you know, she sits at this particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. Hard and tough times. And I'm sure there are many Ugandans out there mm -hmm. who are in the same spot. Mm -hmm. What would be the best way forward from where you sit as a, mm -hmm. uh, a business counselor? Very good. The first thing that comes from the two stories is that, um, one, your market that you used to know has changed. And it has changed both in terms of volume and in terms of purchasing power. And that change is not going to be just for this period or for the next two, two months. It could even be for six months, it could even be for a year, before those original volumes and original purchasing powers are restored. Now, that appreciation is extremely key, extremely, extremely key. 
because now you who has been having a certain type of product either you reconfigure that product to now look at this scenario that has got reduced volumes or reduced aspects in terms of full quality and the buyer is actually also reasonable so you don't need to necessarily say that I still need to have brought this kind of quality of a particular solution because it used to have a customer. Some of those now you are going to be pragmatic and just say that until I get a customer who wants this kind of a set of chairs and it deposits 70%, I don't need to keep this in my stocks. It's real adjustment. But then the other aspect is that core element of what makes people come out of a crisis is and good enough, you can see how the Ugandan entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are responding. Patricia is saying <coughs> she feels distressed that she knows a, an employee called Mary, an employee called Emmanuel, who has a family who has got rent to pay. And she's saying, I've tried for one month, I've tried for a second month. But they also know that really this money is coming from sales. So again, here is a story of borrowing what we learned from Victoria's schools. Conversation with all the key stakeholders and telling them you are now part of the story. You are part of the family. What options can we now live with as we go through this game? But the message is very clear. It is tough. Adjustments are real and must be. And uh, it's no longer business as usual. No, not at all. Good. Okay, I come mm. back to you. Um, again, um, you know, Uganda, like you rightly put it, we cannot, it appears, uh, see uh, or optimize our potential in the agricultural sector uh, without the regional market. And right. regional market, I think one of the biggest markets for a number of Ugandan goods is the Kenyan market. Correct. Um, tell us, um, what has been your experience in, you know, trying to approach and doing business across the border? Because, you know, I've seen it from government, especially now uh, in this crisis. Agriculture is being fronted as a silver bullet to actually deal with the economic problems of Uganda. It's like the low-hanging fruit which we can utilize. But give us your real experience as a businessman, you know, trying to do business across the border. Um, sometimes we focus on the production side and we forget the market mm -hmm. and how you reach the market. Um, the, 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 the Kenyan market, um, the Tanzanian market too, all of these markets, uh, some of them have one, larger populations than Uganda. Uh, both of, um, most of these markets also, even, even the Congolese market will have, uh, they will have maybe some very strong and big urban centers within them. Uh, in, in Congo you have uh, places like Bombashi, Kinshasa, which are very big big cities with you know nine eight million people so these are big markets um, however uh, those are much bigger than we have uh, currently in Uganda however you need to understand that these markets could be uh, cost sensitive that they are looking at uh, they are looking at us producing at a lower cost mm. so we have to take advantage of the things that we produce uh, uh, at a good cost for instance products that are byproducts of maize, or my products of maybe oil seeds, for instance, uh, soya, for instance, um, sunflower. It is these products that we might be able to produce in some combination, add some value, and sell into their markets. And uh, the, the protein has been one of the big ones. Milk, uh, chicken meat, and mm -hmm. eggs has been one of the ones that are close to me that I understand a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we found uh, a bit of success, I think, in Kenya. Mm. Um, there, has been, uh, there has been quite a bit of a lift that comes from uh, a combination of uh, investors that come from that market, coming into this market, who understand where the production is cheaper, but also have the contacts, have the, they know the lay of the land on the other side. And this, this is certainly, uh, certainly is, a, is a driver and something that uh, is not something that is built in a day. It is something that takes a number of building blocks to be in place mm -hmm. uh, to be able to satisfy and uh, produce for these markets. I hear you. I hear you. Um, how is market access? Are you finding it easy to do business across the border? 
Well, it depends on the time. I mean, all of these markets will, um, in times where there is, uh, in times where there is reduced demand, will become protectionist. They will, they will try to hold mm -hmm. on to their own local producers. All these markets have mm -hmm. some aspect of local production, mm -hmm. and you have to understand that uh, at a time when there is reduced demand, for instance, in Kenya, uh, they are deprived of their annual two million, two million or so tourists per year. Yeah. And once they don't have these tourists, that's a very big market. Yes. Two, uh, two million people with uh, very high incomes coming into your market for two weeks uh, are, are big spenders. Mm. And uh, you know they consume chicken, they consume milk, they consume fruits, they consume so many things. And so is Uganda in the same exact vein. We've got, um, we, we, were, we were around the million mark, a little bit over the million mark. Mm. And, uh, to have to get to a point where we are at zero and you don't have business tourists, you That's don't have, you yeah. don't have conferences, mm. you don't have events, you don't mm. have weddings, you you know, all of that is now down to zero. No workshops. Yeah. Um, you 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 know that uh, that uh, you're dealing with a very unusual situation. Mm. It hits your heart, and I think Charles, this is a very important point he's raising because uh, mm. uh, probably we might pose a question whether given the crisis that the East African economies are dealing with, mm. are we likely to see states retreating to being protectionist? Because they've lost yeah. their biggest cash cow. But before you come in, yeah. I'd like to pick uh, Patricia's experience, mm. you know, mm. doing business within the East African region. Because we're talking East African common market. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, we've been focused on Uganda. We did have a, a branch in Rwanda, mm. but we had to close down it became very difficult to do business because of the, the politics surrounding. As, as Ugandans, it was difficult to do business in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. We persevered for a while, and we had established ourselves pretty well until we decided it's best to pull out. So whereas we are, we are, we are looking at, at uh, nations becoming protectionist, yeah. we also have to look at the political side of it. The, that when, when the politics between the two countries is not good, it affects the people doing business. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charles, regional business is a very, very yeah. critical. Uh, Listen to the two stories again. You can see the kind of lessons we pick here. One constant is that the entrepreneur always makes the last call. By the time Nina Interior was assessing the situation and saying what are my options and everything else, if they had relied on a particular external whatever force, it could take forever. But an entrepreneur must be ready to make that call. When is it do you think enough is enough and I let it go? And that's the game of an entrepreneur. And that's the kind of a skill that's not something you can pick from a textbook. Mm. And it's not as easy as just saying, I'm out of Kigali. Mm. You debate it, you dream over it, you struggle with it, and then you're saying, I have my manager, they are doing well. And it's a tough I have balance. my customers, they, are, they love me. Yes. But Sorry I'm, for the interjection, Charles. Yeah. It's a tough balance because on one yes. side, yeah. we're telling them that patience pays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then yes. Yeah, there exactly. comes a time <laughs> when you have to say enough is enough. Enough mm -hmm. is enough. Mm -hmm. That is the tough, tough game of an entrepreneur. And I wish we as a country can appreciate that the brands that we admire the Nina Interiors, the Yuga Chicks, and others that we admire. The people behind that brand, the kind of energy and effort they apply to keep it on the market, we should be celebrating them much more. But I also want to make some more comment about what Yuga Chick has gone through, the pro protectionist outlook of the market that we have been exporting to. Uganda has been talking about import substitution. Mm -hmm. That word is not a prerogative of Uganda. Mm -hmm. Kenya is speaking the same. They also say import substitution. And who, who are they substituting? Is the import from the neighboring countries? Yeah. Now, if they do that, the good thing that Aga said was that the populations have not gone away. The populations will still need solutions. As they work on their import substitution policies, you as an entrepreneur, you work on the three things that determine the triangle of satisfaction. Yeah and competitiveness, which is your cost base, mm. your pricing, your quality, and all these three, when you concentrate on one, it's sometimes at the cost of the other. But when you bring in innovation, 
you begin to make sure that you can benefit from a, a low cost base, reasonable quality, reasonable price, and still get into that market. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we need to be cultivating and supporting an, our entrepreneurs on. Yeah. We have not concentrated on talking on how to make our people compete better across the borders. We just feel, let them export, let them export. But they export into a country which is doing yeah. imported substitution. Mm -hmm. Not easy. That's a good one. Aga, we'll come back to you again. Of course, we live in a season where sales are low. Like mm -hmm. the way to put it at the beginning of this discussion, this interface. Um, and yet, you have to stay in business. Um, how have you been able to, you know, balance the two? Uh, of course, a lot of sales coming in, and you still have a business to run, which you want to see sustained for the future. How have you managed to do that balance? It's been, I think it's been, uh, it's been, it's been a, cha it's been a big challenge. Um, we. Um, you end up having to run a, almost a, 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 a dual personality. You have to think uh, about the long term of the business, which you always have to bear in mind, that, that there is a long term picture mm. in the business. But you have to think about some short term survival mm. techniques. So you have to think about it that you are, it, it, it's, it's almost a wartime. You're in the middle of, of a, a short period where things are difficult around you. Um, some of the things that we would look at would be um, cost freezes on certain items. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain things that you need to do that you need to just decide that we will hold on uh, and we'll maybe come back to those in the right. new year. Uh, if you're doing a small expansion somewhere, you're doing something that, uh, that, that you had planned for that would take you into the new year, um, you need to figure out, you know, do I put a hold on to some of these activities? Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to make tough decisions. You might have to make tough decisions around something like uh, uh, CSR activities. You might have to decide what is it that I can do, what is it that I can't do in that environment. Um, you know, so it's, 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 it's rationalization. But and yet you still have to remember that you still have a team. You need to protect them. Mm -hmm. They need to remain safe. Mm -hmm. They need to have all the basics to continue to work. And the wheel needs to continue turning a little bit slower, mm -hmm. but you need to continue working uh, with what you have. So um, it's a lot around resource uh, rationalization. I think mm -hmm. that, that that tends to be critical. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Patricia, I'm sure your experience is not different mm -hmm. as well. How have you managed, you know, to create that? Because I know there are a number of business people out there who are watching you and are saying how have these guys you know these guys made it mm -hmm. uh because i mean i'm sure it's not the first crisis you're contending with it could be the first of its magnitude but you've managed so how are you handled um well like i said before there really was no money coming in yeah. but their fixed costs we had to pay We've, already, we've been discussing in different forums about the landlord and tenants issue. Mm. We are tenants in certain areas, and that bill has to be paid. Then I also already me uh, mentioned the, the HR situation. You have 87 people waiting for an income. Those are 87 plus families waiting for an income. So there's no money coming in, but costs were building and had to be met, had to be paid. And uh, w we had to make tough decisions and decide very early in the game that we're canceling this contract, mm. we're, 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 we're going to write to, to this entity and ask them to suspend their services to us. Very quickly, we, we, came, w we sat down as a team mm. and made a list of those things, those expenses that could be suspended, and we suspended them. Mm. And then, of course, going, we're now in June, heading towards um, the end of the year, there are things you, you, you have to look at and say that even though we are not earning as expected, we still need to do this, otherwise we get left behind yeah. in the game. Yeah. So, like he said, it's about rationalization, like <laughs> balancing. Absolutely. Yeah. Charles, mm. um, when you build a business and it stays for quite some time, I mean, it's, it's a citizen of its own in a community. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has responsibilities to a community where it sits mm. and to people it employs and affects. Mm. Mm. Uh, you face with such a situation. Mm. Um, 
what would be your best counsel going forward to complement the mm. input given by you know mm. the business operators here? I think um, the, the, the two panelists have really illustrated the kind of uh, a business mindset that people go through under yeah. these kind of circumstances. Yeah. And the listeners need to know that these are <coughs> not things that you go through all the time. Yeah. They come and they have a certain magnitude. There is a story of a similar reaction in the European, uh, UK market, a certain man called Richard Branson a very well respected business entrepreneur. He had a branch, a subsidiary operating in Australia. He made a decision very early and put it under liquidation. Now many people would have said, oh my God, that is too cruel. He was saying, I'm saving many other p parties who were hanging on to that value chain. Mm. There were people who were suppliers. There were people who were doing consultancies with that particular arm of the Virgin, uh, Virgin Group. And he said, if I do not cut this as early as possible, I'm going to deepen the bleeding and the pain of many other people. The earlier sometimes you shoulder this case, the better. But also you could see what our colleagues have been saying. You know, in medicine, they have an emergency room with oxygen for ventilation. When you want to do the bigger thing, first do the giving of oxygen to make you pass through. This lean period when you are gasping for oxygen. When you are gasping for oxygen, there's no luxury of trying to do a, a, a leg surgery. Sort out this one first. Once that one has been stabilized, then you can now say, let's go to the leg. Mm. And then after that, get the patient back moving. So this is rational. This is realistic. Yeah. And as we look at the options of our private sector, let's talk to them, let's listen to them. These people are working a game that is totally, totally, you don't have a book you go and read and just say, you go and read John chapter 3 verse 16, it will guide you. No, you live with the decisions, mm. you live with the uncertainty, and you live with the consequences. Mm. Good. Aga, I'll come back to you. Um, and. Dear viewers, we are looking at, um, you know, the issues around um, business operations, especially around this period. But of course, the principles we are discussing can actually yeah. apply beyond COVID-19. Mm. We're trying to look at the practical way of how a business can actually survive uh, this crisis by picking the experiences of people that are actually sitting uh, within this crisis and are operating businesses. Um, Aga, um, Moving on to another topic, you run a family business. Okay. And uh, in Uganda, of course, we've been globally appreciate, appreciated as being one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world. Mm. But again, uh, in the same breath, I think Charles has already mentioned this, mm. uh, quoting some reports of how the mortality rates of business in Uganda is extremely high. You would be lucky to find a business that has lasted five years. Mm. Um, Share with us your experience. Um, I mean, the business you run, the proprietor, your father still exists, is still around. Okay. Um, how have you managed, you know, to carry on and be effective and do what you do um, in the presence of the founder of the business? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the the the. The question is always good. It's a question asked quite a bit. Mm. Um, <laughs> the, the, the founder of the business is around. I think one of the things that are important is that um, the, the, the founder has uh, established um, a set of, we'd call them guidelines. Okay. Okay. And, 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 and now it's very popular to use the word uh, operating procedures, SOPs. The SOPs <laughs> are much more popular at the yeah. moment. Yes. But they're sort of guidelines, they're guiding principles. What does the business do? What does the business stand for? Um, how does it operate? Who does it uh, deal with? Um, I am uh, fortunate. I have been uh, involved in the business from the start of the business, from inception of the business, that I, the business that I, that I am uh, particularly involved in. And uh, I, um, I find that once you know the guiding principles of the business, it is, it is easier to carry forward. 
the, 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 the founder is present, so the founder provides fundamental guidance. Um, the, prof the founder is a bouncing board all the time. But there has to be a vision for the business going forward. Mm. There has to be, you have to be looking for a place for the business in the market. You have to understand that the market is also not, not waiting for you. It's not, it, is not, it is not stagnant. New players are coming into the market. Mm -hmm. People want to compete for a piece of that same market. And this is a growing market. So um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a function of, it's a function of relationship. It's a function of understanding the business. It's a function of an education and a network and, uh, and a building, a b adding to building blocks that have already been established. Mm -hmm. It's a good one because sometimes these networks, you know, someone might think it's good actually because someone said your network is your net worth. That is good, you know, when you find a business already built, you know, it helps because you find networks that are already built. But sometimes this net, you know, getting the buy-in from the networks is also another thing. But we'll come back to that. Mm. Uh, Patricia, I'm sure your experience is not different from others as well in that particular respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is very important because we have so many of our viewers who have begun businesses. Pass them on, mm -hmm. you know, to Junior and then the business just goes. What is your experience? How have you managed to hold what? Um, well, my experience is not different from Agas. I, I joined my mother very early, very early in, in, in in age, I think I was about 16. Officially, I joined at 16, but I had done earlier tasks as young as nine. Mm. I used to measure sugar in the shop, and we used to sell Vaseline in, in quarter kilo. My job was to measure those things. I, I was doing that after school when I was in P4. So I entered the business very early, and I've worked with my mother not in competition, but as a team. So uh, when the, p the question that you posed to Aga, that how does he feel working in the shadow of his father? Mm. Um, I don't feel like I'm working in her shadow. She has set a standard for me to follow. Mm. She has set a legacy for me to uphold. And I, I endeavor, I work differently, but I endeavor to uphold her legacy. And because I see it as a team effort. It's something we did together as a family. My mother, my sisters, my brother, we're in this together. So it, there are no intricacies or, or infighting or I have to do it this way or that way. We're all going. It's the same vision. We're all going the same direction. Absolutely. Yeah. That's nice. Uh, Charles. Yes. Family business. Um, this is where you come in. Mm -hmm. What do you say from the learnings, from the experiences of these uh, entrepreneurs? In regard to that, I want first to say the listeners must take this kind of uh, lessons extremely seriously. Extremely few businesses have survived a generational change. After businesses have become number one in the market, the family founded the enterprise. But the family, if you checked in detail and did the post mortem, it is the family that killed it. That's painful. Now, from the submissions of these two individuals who are now entering as the next generation. A few elements are some of the things that you must never ignore if the family enterprise must continue and serve the market as the founders did. Number one, you must realize that whatever you are doing as a family business owner, there are two things that you must make sure are not affected, whether your children come on board or they don't. The relevance of your, your solutions, it came out from the submissions. Number two, you must be able to compete. The market is so open and so free that nobody will say, oh, sorry, this is for family so and so. Let's allow them to be in this space. So you must have that clarity as you get your family enterprise built. And then Sekalala brought out the issue of enduring elements that build a sustainable enterprise. Values, mission, objectives, policies. Pass those, and Patricia said, that is the legacy Mami has been talking about. And Mami is simply saying, assist me, let's uphold this. But still again on Patricia's experience, there's that thing that we tend to say, this is my business and I'm doing it for the sake of my children. And what you call for the sake of my children is 
the children in your view should not go through the tough times that you did go through and because of that they should not be seen at primary four to be going to measure sugar it's like punishing a child i right. suffered a lot when i was growing up i do not want my patricia to go through the same alice karugaba the mother of patricia chaze is a lady who simply says this thing can be done at nine years you can measure sugar at 16 i'm going to give you a dedicated direct responsibility as an employee and that meant and she, she made, it, made it very clear officially i was now drafted in with a clear job description and something to deliver these are things we must begin to embrace short of which extremely few businesses in this country have survived a generation of change. Mm. Aga, we've seen um, many times, uh, it no, it's, not, it's not a given that uh, when a parent starts a business, uh, that the children will pick interest in running that business or joining mm. the business. Uh, in any case, we've seen many instances where, you know, kids just get used to a soft life sometimes, mm. especially uh, children mm. of fairly successful people. Uh, and your parents are quite successful people in Uganda and within the region. So um, how did you overcome that, you know, to actually pick interest? And not just pick interest, but do what you do and carry on you, with the battle. Um, you, you, I think um, my colleague here mentioned it. You, you start out early. Mm. You have exposure to the business. You have a positive exposure to the business. I think um, uh, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes the offspring or the next generation could have a negative exposure to the business. They could have an exposure to the business that is one where they feel either it denied them parenting or they could feel that it is, um, um, it is something that uh, when mommy and daddy talk about the business, they're only talking about negative things and mm. all the difficulty that they have. Mm. And as humans, we tend to have... Uh, or others uh, will deploy you to punish you. See, yeah, <laughs> and it happens among farmers. Exactly, farmer, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's also quite common for human beings to have a, a negative bias to yeah. something. You look out for the negative things. I think it's, it's, uh, it's imperative that, um, that uh, the running generation have pride in their own business. Mm and they pass on and share the pride of this business. And, and it is something that is felt that this is not just a legacy, as she called it, but it is, it, it is the family pride. It, is got, it, and it, is got, it has got our name to it. And with that, there is an attraction to it, an interest to it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, I, I, I tell my colleagues, though, that uh, entrepreneurship, though, is not for everybody. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, this tends to be uh, forgotten that, that uh, not uh, out of 10 people, 10 people will be entrepreneurs. Yeah. We've got to accept that. Yeah. So I think it is important that even, um, even the, 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 the generation running the business are, are constantly uh, working with, uh, with the teams or with the next generation to figure out who of these people are, are, are entrepreneurs who's going to be a good entrepreneur, who's going to be a good manager, but some, somebody might just want to be a doctor, mm. or they might want to be you know, an advisor or a consultant. Or and something they could like be very that. good at that. And they could be very good at that. Mm. So I think one is to try and box, uh, put a, 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 a round peg in a square hole, which mm. might not fit. Mm. So there is, an, there is an aspect of searching for the right fit of mm. person and right fit of, of individual. Um, and. Uh, with um, uh, with uh, with our family, we we've all we all get a chance to sort of try out in our own individual spaces, mm -hmm. and to try out uh, at different endeavors mm -hmm. before uh, joining the main f main uh, enterprise. I hear you, mm -hmm. Patricia. Um, beyond, I know you tackled this a little um, on the fact that you began early, mm -hmm. so that helped you to, you know, <coughs> um, first of all, go in and understand what. Uh, should be done as a business person. Uh, but beyond that, what has helped you to keep you know, that fire on, keep interest, 
keep moving? Um, interesting question. I think because, like I said, I started early, very early. It was your after school assignment. Mm. It was an extension of housework at home. So it very quickly becomes a part of you. And then you, you're, you're, you're trained, you're made to understand that whatever you have, whatever you need is going to come from that business. The school fees is going to come from that business. The clothes you wear is going to come from that business. Mm -hmm. the, the food in your stomach is going to come from that business. So it's in your personal best interest to see that the business thrives. So you give your all. Like I told you, I was earning a salary. Mm -hmm. I started at 20,000, uh, then I was earning 70,000, <laughs> 130. You had a choice. You can take a small amount of money that you're given for pocket money, or you can work and earn that 20,000 plus your pocket money. And then you can roll with the big guys when you go back to school. Mm. And of course, you know the choice that I made. Mm. So growing older, you then realize that it's no longer about me, but this business has grown and it takes care of other people. So I mentioned that we have 87 members of staff. Yeah. You then realize that the decisions you make are not just about your stomach, but they're about those 87 people and the people that depend on them. And that, I think, is what, is what cautions me in the decision making. Uh, it, it what really, really keeps me sober when I'm thinking of borrowing. You have to think, will the business survive this long? And will the people who depend on this business mm. continue to depend on it? I hear you. Mm. Charles, um, we've had many business people really complaining and really having issues with mm. uh, their children not having interest mm. in the kind of business or path or career they you know, chose. And uh, of course, a few mistakes have been made. Like I mentioned earlier, we've seen, especially among farmers, it happens. Mm. You know, you don't do something, you're punished by being deployed on the farm <laughs> to do something. <laughs> So um, how do we, again, complementing the input mm. of our entrepreneurs, keep our children part of the business enterprise? I, I want to speak direct to the viewers and tell them that um, whatever you are hearing here are the kind of wisdom, jewel, that you want to make your family enterprise to succeed. What is coming out of here is early conversation with your child, telling the child that I got for you pocket money, it came from the business. I got for you shoes, it came from the business. We are sleeping in this house, we are having water, the business is paying. Yeah. That appreciation will begin to ignite interest. And it is our responsibility to bring that out clearly. Many of us have tended to think that let my child go through school, finish that treasure degree, go for a master's. When they come into the business, they come straight at the level of head of finance, head of marketing. Mm -hmm. Patricia started as a junior, earning a very low salary because that was the value of that position. But then there was something about when she was being introduced that was strikingly positive and Aga also said, please make it a positive exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was positive for Patricia was that, please, there's pocket money for everybody. Yeah. But whoever is able to go and make a contribution at a business, that money is yours. The amount of e effort you put in is rewarded by the business, not money. Mm -hmm. The business will reward you for what you've mm -hmm. delivered. Now, as you do that, the person is beginning to say, hmm, so this is how money is got. If I put in more effort, the rewards get bigger and better. So that kind of introducing our people to the game in a structured way is very good. Many of us delay this game so much and then tell our people now, now that you have got a degree in marketing, you're head of marketing. He has never made a sale. And when he fails, you begin harassing him and calling him all types of names. And indeed, the poor fellow can't succeed overnight just because he has got papers. So you find that you are harassing a person you never tutored, you never nurtured. It is an effort, it's a process, and we must be ready to do that. But also you can now see what comes out of this conversation. As Patricia begins to grow in this thing, <coughs> first of all, Aga Sekalara Jr. was saying, you start with where you have got natural fit. Mm. But as you grow, Patricia says, begin to get a bigger picture now. 
what is the purpose of this enterprise? It's not just about me enjoying something. I'm contributing to the sector where I'm playing. I'm contributing to make the welfare of so many people as employees, as suppliers. And once you have a purpose and you have appreciated it, the family enterprise begin, begins to have identity. Thank you, and Charles. That's a big one. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Viewers, we'll take a very short commercial break. But when we come back, we'll be talking about um, a number of issues, including work, you know, social life balance. Because sometimes we have, uh, like Patricia, our sisters taking the mantle of leadership. And that comes with a number of responsibilities. We'll be knowing much about that. This is very important because in COVID-19, you need business leaders that are seasoned, prepared, and mentored, and refined to actually wither the storm. After this very short commercial break.